Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today, I want to discuss the long-awaited, much-anticipated Xbox Business Update podcast that went down yesterday, and how, despite a whole lot being said, there was plenty left unsaid about the future of Xbox as well. Taking place in an open podcast format, the show was led by Tina Amini, head of Premier Broadcasts, and featured Microsoft Gaming's three heaviest hitters, Phil Spencer, CEO, Matt Booty, President of Gaming Content and Studios, and Sarah Bond, President of Xbox. Pretty much all of the big names you'd expect to see at an event like this, it definitely showed that Microsoft took this seriously, as they should have. The very first announcement confirmed that, as reported beforehand, four previously exclusive titles are coming to other consoles, but these do not include Starfield or Indiana Jones, both of which were rumored to be under consideration for going multi-platform. Strangely, Spencer didn't explicitly state which titles are headed to Switch and PS5, citing a desire to let the developers in charge handle their own reveals. But thanks to more leaks that broke right around the same time, we know that Hi-Fi Rush, Pentamin, Sea of Thieves, and Grounded are the four games expanding beyond Xbox's ecosystem. While I admire Spencer not wanting to steal his studio's thunder when it comes to these announcements, it was another instance of bizarre communication, or lack thereof, from Microsoft regarding the exclusivity of these games. As one of, if not the biggest reason why this event happened in the first place, you might as well rip the band-aid off and cement the status of these titles on your own terms, instead of letting more leaks do the talking for you, and this seemed like yet another avoidable misstep surrounding this shift in strategy. Spencer also expanded on Microsoft's view that the importance of exclusives will continue to shrink, a trend that is holding true across the industry at large, at least to some degree. Just look at Helldivers 2, the surprise smash hit that has more than tripled the previous peak concurrent player count for Sony published games on PC a testament to how releasing across multiple platforms is often a good thing, and something Sony themselves acknowledged during their latest earnings call, doubling down on further expansion into this dual PC, PS5 market. While this change in heart may be true to some degree, how much will companies actually shift their exclusivity strategies? Love it or hate it, exclusives still drive game and hardware sales, and will likely retain some measure of that importance well into the future. Spencer also touched on some of the criteria Xbox considered when selecting games to take multi-platform, like titles that have been out for at least a year, along with those featuring a strong focus on community and live service aspects. Looking through this lens, Sea of Thieves and Grounded both make perfect sense when it comes to landing on other systems, as massive multiplayer titles that would clearly benefit from an expanded player base. Spencer also cited a focus on franchises that Xbox will continue to invest in moving forward, thanks at least in part to the extra profit they'll gain from launching on other platforms. This is good news for fans wanting a Hi-Fi Rush or Pentiment 2, sequels to smaller games that, according to Spencer, were never meant to be platform exclusives at all. Regardless of what criteria Xbox is using to evaluate these decisions, Spencer vehemently reaffirmed that there has been no fundamental change in their view on exclusivity. Microsoft's first-party games will continue to launch day one on Game Pass, and Game Pass will remain on Xbox and PC only, ensuring that subscribers have the earliest and most cost-efficient access to these high-profile releases. The show also discussed Microsoft's continued focus on reaching more players in more places, and in a huge, and honestly unexpected move, they announced their first steps towards bringing Activision Blizzard games into the Game Pass portfolio, starting with Diablo 4 on March 28th. A long-awaited opening of the ActiBlizz floodgates, this clearly signals the start of their titles finally hitting Game Pass. But just how many, and which games in particular will make the cut, remains to be seen. Is Call of Duty coming to Game Pass? That's highly unlikely, as neither Microsoft nor ActiBlizz wants to miss out on the bajillions of dollars that come from yearly COD releases but maybe we'll start to see some older IPs dusted off and given new life thanks to that subscription service. The show also touted 34 million Game Pass members, the first quoted number of subs in over two years, with the last figure being 25 million back in 2022. At face value, this seems like great news, but things get a little murky when you take a closer look. That 34 million number includes subs that were grandfathered in with the shutdown of Xbox Live Gold, so that growth up from 25 million may not be as natural as Xbox might like you to think. Regardless, 34 million subs is nothing to scoff at, providing billions of dollars of revenue and remaining an impressive number for Microsoft to tout, no matter how you slice it. Despite many reaffirmations on continued support of exclusives, the Xbox team also confirmed that they aren't backing away from publishing games on other platforms, which is a good thing. Despite exclusives being a necessary evil to inspire competition and encourage console sales, more players getting to experience more games is better for everyone. And while it's certainly a pipe dream, living in a world with no exclusives, or less of them at least, would be the ideal scenario for all of us as gamers. This commitment to third-party publishing tied in neatly with the discussion on the growth, or lack thereof, health, and sustainability of not only Xbox, but the gaming industry as a whole. 
Spencer openly acknowledged the unenviable situation many developers and publishers now find themselves in. With constantly increasing price tags associated with developing blockbuster games, and a potential install base that hasn't really expanded since the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 era. Going so far as to mention the company's recent layoffs, Spencer once again outlined a strategy consisting of diversification, shifts in exclusivity, and a change in the older mentality of developing games to sell consoles, and stated that all of these have to change, at least to some degree, if the industry wants to remain profitable and viable in the future. To wrap things up, the crew touched on two other critically important topics, new hardware and game preservation. Sarah Bond confirmed that Xbox has info on new hardware coming this holiday season, and perhaps most importantly that a next-gen Xbox is in development, with this new iteration of Microsoft's gaming hardware offering the biggest generational leap ever seen. We'll have to wait and see just what they're cooking up here, but this all sounds extremely promising. And even as someone who primarily plays on PC, I'm very curious to learn more about this promise of a massive generational leap. Finally, Spencer confirmed that despite the many challenges associated with it, backwards compatibility remains a pillar of Xbox's strategy, which is also great to hear. He shared a continued desire to respect player investment in Xbox libraries for future generations, and as someone who owns dozens of Xbox titles spanning three generations, I'm quite relieved to hear that my investment in that ecosystem will continue to carry forward. Heading into this event, you wouldn't be mistaken in thinking that the very future of the Xbox brand was at stake. Thanks to Microsoft's previous communications, miscommunications, and lack of communications, and in no small part due to the various leaks and rumors that ran rampant leading up to the show, this seemed to be it for Xbox. Make or break, do or die, all or nothing. Well, it just so happens that what went down was nowhere near as big of a deal as many people made it out to be. Shocking, I know. But despite some important clarifications on their strategy, and news on the brand's future, the show definitely left some pretty big questions unanswered. Despite Phil Spencer stating that Starfield and Indiana Jones aren't included in the confirmed slate of games heading to other consoles, when questioned on the topic by The Verge's Tom Warren, who has his finger on the pulse of Xbox and gaming almost more than anyone, Spencer had this to say, I don't think we should as an industry ever rule out a game going to any other platform. We're focused on these four games and learning from the experience. Clearly, this leaves the door wide open to not only Starfield and Indy, but pretty much any other games making their way to Switch and PlayStation 5 in the future which was by far the biggest concern for most fans heading into this event in the first place. So, despite everything that was said about a commitment to exclusivity, there was quite a bit left unsaid as well, and it will be very interesting to see how the Xbox community handles a similar situation if, or more likely when, it comes up again. Don't get me wrong, there was some great stuff in the show. Hearing Xbox reaffirm their support for hardware and game preservation was awesome, as keeping the console space competitive and ensuring Xbox owners retain access to their digital, and more importantly physical libraries, are both hugely important for the overall health of gaming in the future. But when it comes to the biggest question, that of exclusivity, there's still a lot up in the air, despite what was said by the Xbox team. Overall, what was seen as the most important Xbox event of this generation, justifiably or otherwise, turned out to be largely nothing groundbreaking at all. But, despite being blown way, way out of proportion leading up to the show, it desperately needed to happen in the face of all those rumors. The bane of Xbox's existence continues to be bungled communication with its fanbase, just as it has been for the last decade. It's nice to clear up at least some of the confusion amongst fans, but it's hard not to feel like this whole situation could have been avoided with better communication. As Spencer himself said in his interview with The Verge, we can't ever rule out any game going to any other platform, making it clear that Xbox can and will consider taking other titles multi-plat down the line. What will the next games hitting other platforms be? As it's practically a question of when, rather than if, Microsoft will expand that strategy. But just how much they do remains to be seen. Exclusives coming to Xbox and PC through Game Pass first, then hitting other platforms later doesn't seem like a huge deal, depending on the titles in question and we're already seeing a similar shift in PlayStation's PC strategy that's likely to accelerate even further. But Nintendo and Sony still don't put their games on other consoles, and it's quite possible they never will. Did Xbox only change their stance on exclusivity for Starfield and Indiana Jones after all the backlash online? Or was this always their plan, and the leaks and rumors were simply blown out of proportion? Regardless of how we got here, the Xbox business update managed to say a whole lot and a whole lot of nothing at the same time and the second half of this console generation will be very interesting to watch unfold, not only for Xbox, but for Sony and Nintendo as well. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe for more gaming content, and let me know your thoughts on the big Xbox business podcast in the comments below. You're a real one and I appreciate you. Catch you later, homies.